Welcome back. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the AE Squared, Mr. Don Reinertsen. Don, so great to have you. Don, I, I've been uh, looking forward to this for the last two years. You have been seriously living rent-free in my head, and it is a pleasure to have you here. It's a true honor. So for those who ha aren't familiar with you or your work, mm -hmm. could you take a second, and, and uh, mo most of our audience are engineers or business owners or whatnot. What is a, a company owner or a product developer or whatnot, what do they look like in, where, in their business today that really points to they need to meet you and the work that you outline in your books. What, what, is, what does their world look like before uh, engaging in flow? Um, I would say that there's a lot of stuff that is done by tradition of we have always done it this way, or I read about how a project should be managed, or I read about how Toyota reduces variability and Deming says variability should be low and things. But they've been basically processing these ideas non-critically. And they're not thinking about why do they work sometimes and not work other times. And I think, you know, that to, to me, one of the biggest issues is that they will always tell you that we're trying to deliver value to shareholders or produce stuff that has more value than it costs to make and stuff like that. And then, then you say, well, uh, so what causes you to make money in your business? And mm -hmm. they, you know, do pe people buy your product because I, a guy I worked with at HP used to say, my definition of a good product is I have it and you don't. <laughs> now, he was a big believer in cycle time as sure. adding value, and, and HP placed a lot of emphasis in those days on, on cycle time. But I, I'll encounter people who will say, oh, I think we should shorten our development cycle, and uh, I'll ask them, I said, well, what makes you think you will make more money with a short development cycle than and with a long one? Right. And the answer is, I don't know. And thought I, about that. I read in a magazine that shorter was better. Right. And so there's a lot, there's, there's, you know, a huge amount of I read or heard something that was a plausible narrative that has people chasing after stuff that actually doesn't make much engineering sense. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I tend to, I, I think probably the biggest thing about my approach to the problem is I like to view it as an engineering design problem, right. is that we can think of the design of a development organization, the design of a development process, as if it was an engineering problem instead of being a problem in a different domain. So, interesting. So when you talk about Deming and Toyota, obviously in my industry and many others, the, the buzzword of the day is, is to take an agile approach to product development. And exactly as you say, a lot of folks, I went through that, trying to apply it, not really understanding what it is, but mm -hmm. just the promise that things would be better, right? Our struggle was, it seemed like agile made sense and you could accept it as long as you were developing a website or a full stack software. But the minute you tried to design physical things, it became very, very cumbersome at best and confusing most often in terms of how do I measure what better looks like? Mm -hmm. So within the construct of, of what you're doing, making this into an engineering project, what are the measurement devices that you would recommend uh, someone new to your system look at? How do you start that process, looking at it from an engineering perspective? Yeah, yeah. Well, usually I, I, I start with the... I mean, it, like, often people will say, I need certain metrics. Mm -hmm. um, they say, oh, let's go to a metrics conference and hear about good metrics to use. And I would always ask them, I'd say, well, okay, so um, you're not really interested in metrics. What you're really trying to do is design a control system, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, if, if metrics caused behavior change, uh, everyone who bought a bathroom scale would be losing weight. Right. 
is you know it's it's got to be part of a closed loop system and then the question is if you're designing this closed loop control system and you're trying to pick a parameter that you're going to control you probably want to pick a parameter that is causal to economic success mm -hmm. you don't randomly pick parameters and so you got to because if if the intent is to influence economic outcomes you need to ask which parameters influence the economic outcomes and therefore where do I put and in and design the control loops? And you know, the, the huge admission, uh, omission that we saw for, for decades was people were spending, you know, I, I would work with a design team and um, they, I do an analysis on the part of the, the original one I did back in 83 is we saw that if they overran their development expenses by 50%, it would cost like 3% of life cycle profit. If they missed uh, their, let's say, if they missed their product cost by uh, 10%, it would cost 50% of life cycle profits. So clearly they were in a, I'm, you take cycle, right. cycle time out of this for now. Right. Even in that particular case, you'd say, that product cost, bill of material cost, had far more leverage than development mm -hmm. expenses for that company. And then I would ask them, how are you spending your control over? What percent of the effort you spend on control is devoted to the parameter of expenses versus the bill of material cost? Right. So what you would discover is once a week, they were reporting on where were their current expenses, What's their expense budget? How are they going to stay within budget over the entire program? So weekly effort on tracking all of the expenses and things, they didn't even do a roll up on bill of material cost until they were probably a third of the way through the program. Right. And so there, was, there, 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 there were parameters that had enormous economic leverage that they were not paying any attention to. And you suck away all of the energy and time on parameters that have insignificant economic impact, right. and it means you're not going to control the other ones. Right. And in contrast, you would look, for example, at an automotive company, and they, ha they do really good cost-focused design, but they're tracking the cost of each part down to the three decimal points from the very beginning of the process. They have control systems that are really focused on the things that have the most impact. And, and I think, you know, ultimately, when you start looking at a lot of these choices, you look at choices of how do I organize a team? Well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've had functional organizations, we've had cross-functional teams and things like that, but basically every cross, every organization design choice is a choice to strength to strengthen certain communication links, and you automatically weaken so other much. communication links when you strengthen the others. Right. And so, the organization design question is: Which of the communication links am I trying to optimize? Right. If I've got terrible communications between manufacturing and engineering and things like that, I need to have an organization structure where I have manufacturing people located in engineering and engineering Universal people lo located in manufacturing is, you know, I, I need to work on the links that have a lot of information that needs to flow and a high tendency to corrupt that information. And so rather than the traditional approach of draw an org, org chart and see what the flavor of the month is, right. I think it, it's much better to go back to basic principles of saying, these organization choices are, are creating needs for communication. Where do I want the really good communications to be within this system? Right. So embedded in what you just said there, would it be safe to say that the first principle metric to think about in, in all design organizational choices or whatnot is what is the, the incremental impact on life cycle profits? Is that the, That's, the basic... That's First what principle? I've I've yeah. I found that you know I, I use cumulative life cycle profit right and it's really worked well for me for about thirty years and um, 
it, it works well because you know, when you ask people, well, why are we doing this? Why, right. why are the shareholders giving us money to right. design this product and things like that? And the notion is that the business is sustainable if giving you money produces money in return. Right. I think that, that, that well, we're ultimately developing products not to win awards, we're doing it to, to make money. Profit. It's a, it's a, yeah. a profit-making business and things mm -hmm. like that. So certainly one of the first questions you need to ask is, uh, is you know, how do we make money in this business? Uh -huh. and, and, and when you do that thoughtfully, you look at, uh, be, before we sat down here, I was talking a little bit about HP. You, yeah. know, you look at how much money is made on a printer and how much money is made on the cartridges that are sold for the printer or the cartridges for the... Do you think that is an accident no. that they stumbled across that? No. Or might there actually be a thoughtful design behind that right. product and pricing structure and system in order to create that annuity of profits from the right. cartridges and inkjets.